You guys have been asking for it, and we're finally ready to tell you all about the Threadripper processor. Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Shrell. Welcome to PC Perspective. Today, we're gonna to talk about the review, the numbers, the performance of AMD's Ryzen Threadripper CPUs. We're gonna look at the 1950X, mostly because it's the flagship part, but also we have uh, the Threadripper 1920X as part of our review as well. 16 cores for the flagship, 12 cores for the, I don't know, mid-range, the slightly lower tier part. I don't think we need to talk a whole lot about the specifications of these CPUs because we have been building up to this release for such a long time. Threadripper, whole new socket, uses the Zen architecture, uh, available in 16 core 32 thread options and 12 core 24 thread options. Frequencies ranging from 3.4 base to 4 gigahertz boost on the 1950X, 3.5 to 4 gigahertz on the 1920X, uh, 64 lanes of PCIe, quad channel DDR4 memory, uh, all, all, the, all the stuff that you guys already know and are aware of. So no one wanna spend a whole lot of time on that. So let's talk about what we do know, what we can tell you that we didn't, uh, we weren't able to tell you before. One, uh, the interesting architectural change with this release does not come from memory uh, you know, channels or CPU design or anything like that. It really comes down to memory modes. So there's an idea of NUMA, non-uniform memory access, and then the counterpart to that, which is UMA, unified memory access. Uh, and this processor can act in both of those modes. I'm gonna go into a light amount of detail here. I highly encourage you, basically everything we talk about today is gonna be much more in-depth uh, discussed in the review at PCPer.com. Uh, this is not a simple topic to dive into, so make sure you, you do that. The general idea is, with this processor, you will be able to enable two different memory modes, one called local slash NUMA, and one called distributed slash UMA. And this basically puts the processor into a state where of, of how it balances memory access, memory um, placement, and how the operating system sees the two processors. In UMA mode, which is the default distributed mode, the operating system sees 16 cores, 32 threads, one memory pool, all that stuff is the same. And it kind of works exactly as you would expect it to work. All the processors and applications access memory accordingly. They distribute memory load across all four channels of memory, et cetera. In the local mode slash uh, uh, NUMA, the uh, Windows boots up as two NUMA nodes. So you actually see one node of eight core 16 threads and another node of eight core 16 threads. It accesses memory slightly different. It turns, tends to weight towards the controllers pointed to, or the controller attached to the die slash node that it is associated with. The long story short is different applications are gonna perform differently based on these, these different settings. Uh, in general, applications that are highly latency sensitive will likely perform better in the NUMA mode, the local mode, uh, if they don't exceed the memory capacity of the two channels of memory that are associated with that node, and or they don't exceed the thread capacity of the NUMA node that you're talking about. Once you go outside of that, different complications come into play. Any application that is highly threaded that will distribute the workload and memory load across uh, a, a large range without complications will actually do better in UMA mode. Uh, the, 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 the use case for Yuma mode, or I'm sorry, for NUMA slash local is really gaming, right? So AMD knew that because of this architecture design, we now have one more hop of latency between two threads in possibility, right? You go from die to die on this multi-die package that we didn't have to deal with with Ryzen 7, 5, or 3. In instances where threads need to communicate and they are operating on different physical die, uh, there's the chance for added latency across the board. So by putting the system into a local slash NUMA mode, you give the operating system hints that it should keep all of these threads in one place, all the memory they need in one place, and hopefully improve performance. Uh, we did a lot of our ping testing uh, with this new platform as well, something we've done, kind of this thread-to-thread -thread latency. And we do see that the Threadripper processor has another level of latency when it crosses those physical dies. So even though there's infinity fabric between the CCXs on the same die and between the two die, you are gonna see an increase to like a 200 to 250 nanosecond uh, additional memory latency if threads have to cross across those physical die. Again, more details at PCPro.com if you're interested in what that actually means for your performance or your software or any applications you happen to be using. Other worth, uh, another thing worth noting here 
is this is the first time we're going to be able to use and talk about our X399 motherboards. We're going to have more topics on this coming up, reviews and all that. Uh, I do want to say that with Threadripper and the X399, X399 chipset, products like the ROG Zenith Extreme, which is what we used for our testing, um, really show the flagship capability of this platform. Uh, tons of features, tons of capability, also kind of comes with a high price. This motherboard is like $550, so it's gonna be super steep. They're not all gonna be that price, but expect to pay somewhere around X299 Skylake X platform prices for these particular motherboards. Um, Cooling considerations to take into account. This is a very big processor. It's 180 watt TDP. It's going to get pretty hot. AMD actually shipped us a 360 millimeter thermal take radiator self-contained cooler to use. Uh, and inside the retail packaging, which we already showed you, comes with a bracket to adapt Asetek style slash the teeth style coolers to the Threadripper TR4 socket and platform. Uh, so you, you definitely have capability there. There's a lot of existing coolers that will work with it. Uh, and we already have seen some coolers shipping with the necessary brackets uh, or will ship you the brackets in addition to uh, if you buy it after the fact or something to that effect. Um, but you will need water cooling for this. You know, I, I think maybe if you get some of those giant Noctua coolers, you might be able to maintain. Um, but if you plan to do anything with overclocking, really plan on getting a 240 millimeter radiator, maybe even scraping up into that 360 mil radiator range. Uh, we uh, will have overclocking results. We didn't have them finished when we had to record this video, so go to the review at pcper.com and we'll get into temperatures, overclocking capability. All indications are that this is somewhere in a 3.9 to 4 gigahertz for all cores type of overclock, which would be you know, you know, several hundred megahertz higher than what you get out of the box, so that will be good to see. Now let's talk about performance. We did uh, a ton of benchmarking on this, including NUMA versus Yuma performance, uh, different memory speed performance, 2400 megahertz, 3200 megahertz. And the general consensus with those two things, faster memory still matters to Threadripper, just like it did with our first generation Ryzen processor reviews. The difference between gaming performance and other applications when running at the higher frequency memory speed is, is pretty significant and, and worth noting. And if you're somebody who's buying a $1,000 CPU or even an $800 CPU, chances are you're also going to buy some of that higher end, higher frequency memory. So 3200 megahertz or 3000 megahertz, or yeah, 3000 megahertz memory seems to make the most sense for us there. When looking at NUMA versus Yuma, the general performance implications are this. In games, the difference is minimal at best with maybe one oddity where we saw like a 10% difference and that was in Deus Ex Mankind Divided where it was faster in the local slash NUMA mode versus distributed mode. In general, the gaps there are pretty small and my recommendation would be to keep the platform in Yuma slash distributed mode because of the advantages that provides for the rest of the applications that you may be using. Um, it's important to note that, you know, AMD doesn't, AMD isn't marketing this as a gaming first platform and in fact they're really targeting professionals, prosumers, content creators, people that have a workload that can clearly demonstrate the benefits of a highly threaded system, right? So if you don't have a workload uh, that can utilize 16 cores, 32 threads, or 12 and 24, then if your focus is gaming, chances are there's a better option for you, whether it be the Ryzen 7 1800X or a, a uh, Kaby Lake processor or something to that effect. This is, have a workload you know you wanna work with this first, gaming second, and it's gonna, and it's gonna do just fine. Uh, and, and when we look at just the raw gaming benchmarks, it's, it's not fantastic. Even when we, kind of, we standardized on Yuma testing for the most part, uh, we tested 1080p, 25 by 14, and 4K. As you expect, once you get to higher resolutions like 4K, the differences between the Threadripper part and the Skylake X Core i9 7900X are pretty much gone. It's homogenized to the performance of the GPU. At 2560 by 1440, there actually were still some performance deltas uh, where the Threadripper was a little bit behind the 7900X thanks to its higher single threaded and lightly threaded clock speeds and IPC capabilities. From a purely gaming standpoint, I don't think there's any getting around the fact that Skylake X and Kaby Lake are going to be faster gaming platforms than Threadripper. But again, this all comes back to hopefully you're buying Threadripper for a specific workload or mindset. 
right? So it's, it is not a buy this for the best gaming platform. It is going to be buy this for the best something else. And then also you can do incredibly fast gaming on it as well. From our normal CPU tests, uh, check out the review for, for a, a huge assortment of testing and benchmarks. In general, the differences are gonna range from highly threaded workloads like Cinebench, where we see a 37% advantage for the 1950X over the 7900X, uh, which is pretty amazing. Pavre showed a 30% difference. Uh, one of our blender tests was in the 20% range. There's, there's a lot of instances where clearly the core and thread count advantages that Andy provides with Threadripper today over the currently available Skylake X parts uh, really shine, right? And, the, and they really make the case for the added performance and the added uh, uh, integration of core that you see uh, on Threadripper. When you get into some of the other single-threaded tests or even lightly-threaded workloads, say you're looking at uh, Audacity, which is our MP3 encode. It's very single-threaded. Skylake X is still significantly faster. The performance of Threadripper 1950X is essentially on par with a Ryzen 7 1800X, which is a processor you can find for under $450 today. So know what your workload is and know what you want to get out of this platform before you dive into it. Power consumption-wise, we complained about the 7900X being a very high power usage part. This is actually beyond that. The 79, 7900X had a TDP of 140 watts. Both Threadripper processors have a TDP of 180 watts, and they use anywhere from 30 to 40 watts more power than the Intel parts in our uh, testing, right? So that's, you know, you're pushing 260, 270 watts of consumption total system, not just for the processor, but way ahead of anything we've ever seen before. AMD will kind of talk up the idea of power per core, like efficiency on a per core basis. And that's neat from an architectural standpoint, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything to somebody. It's really performance per watt. And, um, you know, as long as the Threadripper is running that workload you want, higher at a higher percentage increase than the power consumption increase, you're going to be at a better performance per watt uh, than what Intel Skylake X platform can offer. I, I feel like I talked for a long time about this and we have barely brushed the surface of what Threadripper really means. There's, there's 64 lanes of PCIe we didn't get into. We didn't talk about storage performance. We haven't gotten into multi-GPU performance. This is all testing that we're going to do in the coming weeks and kind of really evaluate what advantages Threadripper may have or disadvantages Threadripper may have over all the other competing high-end solutions out there. PCPer.com, we have tons of, uh, of benchmarks, power testing, comparisons of NUMA versus Yuma, and you know, 20 applications. Uh, there's a lot of work that went into this review. Hopefully you found this video version of it somewhat interesting and you got some semblance of what we're thinking from it. If you're in the market for a $1,000 processor and you know that rendering, ray tracing, content creation, video encoding is something that, that you're going to be focused on, the Threadripper is, is an amazing piece of hardware. And now there's no sacrificing on the platform selections. There's no sacrificing on any level of performance to get there. Um, but don't buy this part if you want to do gaming first. If your focus is enthusiast gaming, there's better parts out there from both AMD and Intel. And though AMD deserves a lot of credit for going through the motions of uh, allowing customization to enable compatibility mode or enable that game mode or NUMA versus Yuma. Uh, it doesn't take away from some of the fundamental differences that the architecture provides over its competition. So again, PCPer.com, please, please, please go there and check out the full review. Lots of detail in that story, but let us know if you've got any questions in the comments below, and uh, we'll see you guys on follow-ups in the coming weeks. If you enjoyed this content, consider supporting in-depth technical content by contributing at patreon.com slash PCPer.